Welcome to the 10th episode of the No BS Pagan Podcast. Tonight, Tina and I are joined again by Björn Ekdal from Sweden. Björn is the founder of the Haminja Foundation and Podcast. Lovely to have you back, Björn. Thanks for having me. Nice to be back. Yeah, a lot of people really liked the, the last podcast that we did together. And it looked we, like it, yeah. Great. Yeah, we didn't get to talk about everything that we wanted, so let's <laughs> do that today. Uh, so the first question that I'd like to start with, could you tell us about the Indo-European deity equivalents? So the, the deities that are very similar between different regions, and for anyone that doesn't know how these deities are related, could you please explain how they are connected? Absolutely. Um, I'm sure that all of your listeners have uh, once or twice they've come come upon um, or found uh, um, deities, etc., that that um, look the same, have the same characteristics, uh, the same functions, etc. And there is a reason for that, uh, and that simple reason is because all Indo-European peoples scoop out of the same source. And that source is the Proto-Indo-Europeans, our oldest ancestors. Um, in lack of a better name, we call them Proto-Indo-Europeans because we actually don't 100% know what they call themselves. So um, uh, they lived on the Pontic Caspian steppe, north of the Caspian Sea and Black Sea in today's Russia and Ukraine. I think I said this last time. Um these people or peoples, tribes, they split up and they migrated west into Europe and south and southeast and spread over Europe and parts of Asia into Pakistan, uh, India, Iran, etc. And with them, they, of course, brought their culture, their creation myth, uh, their spirituality, their cosmo cosmology, uh, their worldview, etc., and much, much later, they were the ones becoming the Vedics, the Greeks, the Romans, the Germanics, the Celtics, uh, or the Celts, the, the Slavic peoples, Persian peoples, etc., both linguistically and, and uh, culturally. So the reason we see equivalence and similarities between the Indo-European so-called pantheons, I don't really like that word, but... That is because they all stem from from the same cosmology and cosmogony, cosmogony, um, and uh, the protein Europeans divided their society into three layers or strata: a religious or sacral, a juridic and warrior group, and a producing and commercial stratum. Uh, the same thing with their gods: a father sky. A thunder and warrior god, Mother Earth, uh, fertility gods, gods connected to the home, uh, gods connected to their path and their herding, etc. So again, when we see equivalents and similarities between the European pantheons, it is because they all stem from the same understanding of how everything is put together. We have... Um, we may have different names and, and uh, cultural expressions, but the understanding and functions are the same. So so that's the, the simple reason. Um, if you want me, or people can contact me if they want. Uh, we In our community, we have long lists of deity equivalents, etc. Et so uh, just um, get in contact. Yes. I, I hope, that answers your, hope that answers your question a bit. It does, yeah. I saw that you had a lot of information about that on the Discord server. Yeah, yeah. And something that really, you know, grabbed my interest were the, the similarities between Indra and Thor and Rudra and Odin. And yeah. if you look, you know, if you look at Wikipedia or whatever, Odin, they don't really describe him as being very old at all. But is this no. e evidence of that he goes way, way back, like we believe. The that is a uh, you have s such a huge questions. Um, <laughs> well, Odin has his functions has they have changed a lot over time. Uh, it is true that Woden or Odin that stems from the Proto-European root wet, 
which means uh, infuriated or, or raging or, or um, even Frenzied. drunk. Mm. Um, so, uh, so, so that function uh, is very, very old. The inspiration, the breath, the, the, the spirit and the, the poetic uh, truth poetic inspiration uh however odin was rather initially a, a, a psychopomp function so uh, so odin and, and definitely not the all father that's also something very very new historically seen so so his he, he was there from the beginning that's true but his functions have changed especially when they wandered towards scandinavia etc Okay. It was yeah. um, it, it was the god Tyr that was the considered the uh, yeah. Tyr T was was the yes. the the father sky, uh, yes. the 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 head, and his name is also cognate with Jupiter and Zeus, etc. And is there any clear reason why that supplanting that supplanting has happened? That that is to be honest, that's beyond me why that happened. I I, I wasn't there, so I I I, I um uh, I don't know. But but like with everything else, when these peoples wandered over the continent, they of course uh, stumbled upon new phenomena, new functions, new uh, new everything, new situations, new landscapes, and and I think that's the reason because several gods have, and you know they they didn't just change some gods they even found new gods so so indo-european spirituality is what we call an additive religion or additive spirituality it's uh there are as many gods as there are waves on all the oceans so we find new gods and we see that the romans uh, accepting new gods wherever they came etc so it's not that they changed the functions depending on where they were. It was also that they found new gods, and sometimes they mixed them up, and they um, they were merged or fusioned. Okay, and could you tell us a little bit about the um, the root Indo-European pantheon and the the proto Indo-European language? Absolutely. Again, uh, a very small question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so like I like I said before, the protein Indo-European tribes they lived on these vast grass steppes of Ukraine and Russia. They were a semi-nomadic, transhuman people. So they, uh, yeah, they were herders, um, herding animals, and they they expanded vastly all over the continent and the Asian continent. Um, so, and the the. I mean, we don't know exactly what the original Indo-European language sounded like, but the the, the Proto-Indo-European language is a reconstructed common ancestor of the whole Indo-European language family. And uh, I mean, almost half of the world's population speaks an Indo-European language. So that spread was quite successful, to say the least. Um Again, we don't know exactly what it sounded like, but research on this has been going on for, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for 200 years now, more than 200 years. So it's very well reconstructed with the help of comparative linguistics, archaeology, sociology, history, semantics, phonology, etc. So um, by, for example, comparing the language changes between all the Indo-European languages, we can also go back in time and reconstruct the original uh, Indo-European language. So we know a lot about what it sounded like, um, uh, yeah, how they spoke, what words they have. And, and then if we um, reverse engineer, we can also, by understanding what words they did have, we also understand what kind of culture and lives they had. Uh, since if you have, if for example, if you have uh, the word dome, is it's cognate with home so we know that their homes were round or dome like or sphere like half sphere spheric uh and if you have the, the the word for door or horse or wagon these are all indo-european words and that means that this is how they lived they had houses doors horses uh, etc so that's very interesting i 
uh, highly, because this is, again, a very, very vast topic. So I highly recommend your listeners the book The Horse, the Wheel and Language by David Anthony uh, for those who really want to understand these languages and their own origin, because that's a great book. Uh, about how this was done, how this re reconstruction was done, and I can I can tell you that it was not um, it was not by chance. It's a it's a great science. So that's I, a I little have, bit about I, that. I have a, a follow up question on that. Yeah. Is it true that the Finnish language is not Indo European, or that it has no overlap with any other European language? Um, it's true that it's not an Indo-European language. Uh, it does have relatives, though. It's not like the Basque language. The Basque language, we don't know anything about where it comes from. Uh, okay. But the Finnish language is related, for example, to Hungarian, what? the Magyar, um, and, the, the, of course, the Balto-Slavic or the Balto, um, the Baltic languages. But, yes, uh, it's not related to Indo-European languages at all. And I live just next to Finland, and if you put the words next to each other, you you wouldn't recognize anything. So they're very, very different. But that said, they have, of course, Finns and Swedes have, of course, uh, influenced and, and uh, uh, each other, so to say, definitely. Has Finland been a very isolated culture historically? And could that be the reason? Mm -hmm. Or why is, or is it so I wouldn't different? say I wouldn't say isolated since they are also part of the continent and they had a lot of exchange with Baltic and Slavic countries and they also had the Sami and the Quens up in in the north of Norway Sweden uh, Finland etc and Russia so um that's a question for another for another podcast episode I think because that's also a bit beyond me how that came why they ended up there. So Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit is closer to the Proto Indo European language. Would that be correct? Oh, uh, Sanskrit is an Indo European language. Uh, I mean, is it is it the closest to the old the old language that we've kind of pieced together through the words? Uh, yes. Okay. However, Sanskrit isn't really spoken today. I mean, it functions as a almost like Latin. It's a dead language. Although it's quite close to Hindi, for example. So uh, if you understand Hindi, you also understand Sanskrit. So uh, so yes, it's it's very close. And, and it is the, uh, the, the, the funny thing is that I think it's Lithuanian, which is the absolute closest language to Proto-European of the living of the living languages. Oh wow. So Lithuanian is actually it sounds quite a lot like Proto-Indo-European did, and that's very fascinating. Oh, that's another one to look into then. I've got so many on my list now. Yeah, and, <laughs> and also since the Baltic countries were Christianized so late, it's actually worth looking into those countries because uh, a lot of the traditions, etc., lived on for much, much, much longer than the other European countries. Plus, they have the, the language, which is close. So that's uh, it's worth looking into. For sure. So why don't we move on? And if you could tell us about how you perform ritual, because a lot of people were curious about that. Everyone seems to have different ways of doing it. How do you create a, a sacred space? Hmm. I mean, I guess this is a bit, I wouldn't say infected, but it's it's a bit uh, controversial that, that uh, I mean, like you say, everyone practices differently, etc. I can only speak for me, the Harmonia Foundation, and what we've studied when it comes to Indo-European traditions and what we see they all have in common. Uh, and, and and in this case, so so do you mean how I practice the yeah. spirituality? Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, First of all, it's important to distinguish between the domestic. I, I think this is where people, quote unquote, go wrong, because um, it's important to distinguish between domestic and and public rich, uh, public spirituality. The domestic spirituality was very very free. Every family had their own and has uh, their own religion, so to say, their own gods, their own spirits, their own 
uh, beings, etc., their own traditions, their own culture. So the householder himself or herself is the, the high priest of each family. In Rome and Greece, for example, you have the pater familias, who is the main priest of the family. That's the, the householder. So I think this is where it gets a bit um, wrong because the domestic in the domestic cult, there you you basically celebrate and practice however you want. That said, that doesn't mean that someone would uh, worship a blue cat among our ancestors just because they were a family and they had their own religion. I mean, they 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 only knew what they knew, so to say. They knew they 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 also dug and and scooped out of the same source. So, um, but yes, the domestic uh, cult is very private, very um, different from each other. And then you have the public cult or the public spirituality where there are actually very strict rules. In fact, Indo-European spirituality is built upon that you do the right thing at the right moment with the right words, in the right uh, stru with the right structure. So uh, that's a very important distinction. And I think that when people say that, well, I do whatever I want, well, yeah, that's true. They 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 can do that in their own family and in in their own in their own if they have a, for example, a spiritual practice group, etc. That's perfectly fine, and that that's very well attested that people did. However, when it comes to 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 public uh, cult, that's not true. Um, so so that that was the first thing I I wanted to say. Um, when it comes to myself, I practice in a. I would. I'm Swedish, but I don't practice necessarily in a in a pure Norse or Germanic tradition. I I practice in a in a general Indo-European way. I would say, and uh, so I have a morning ritual which you can see on uh, the Hummingia Foundation's YouTube channel. There is a video for that. Uh, I get up get up early. That's very well attested. Get sunshine if I can or daylight. I take a ritual called bath. I meditate. I count my blessings and I write down things I'm I'm thankful for. Then I purify myself and I pour libations, burn incense, and say prayers to the dawn goddess and the sun god. Um. So again, watch the video on morning. Uh, is the name is video. The, the name is morning ritual in nine steps on our YouTube channel. There you can see the full ritual. Then uh, my evening worship at home is based on the Indo-European fire ritual, where I give libations, oblations, and prayers to the all gods and the shining ones and my patron deities uh, through the hearth fire. I also have a weekly ceremony where I worship the hearth goddess which was also done all over Europe. Um, and then I, of course, do major ritual, public rituals and sacrifices about, uh, I would say, every six weeks. And they, again, they're a podcast episode of their own because that's very complex. Uh, and then you also, I think you also asked about sacred space. Mm -hmm. Um. I first of all, I want to say for all of those who practice at home, I can calm them because that's not something you need at all when you're at home or in your garden, because your home and your garden is a sacred space in itself. Um, so when it the most important when it comes to sacred space is the word sacred itself, because it it stems from Proto-European sec. And it means something like um, something that's um, cut off, set off, or dedicated or consecrated to one sole purpose. And we see this in all the Indo European myths where uh, is, is it Yerd? Yerd, she, um, she, um, she plows these uh, furrows around uh, Zealand, for example. And uh, you see it with um, Romulus and Remus. You see that, that this. Um, sacred space they're making and those who enter without being worthy they get struck or or killed even so the word sacred is important because it means cut off 
So the first thing is that we should, a sacred space should always be cut off or, or like set off or marked out, uh, well fenced off or marked out. And all those who are worthy and they are within the sacred space, they take part of the blessings, not the others. If you're outside the the sacred, you don't you for example, look at the word secular, our modern word secular. You have the sec, the root sec there. So something that is secular is outside that's which which has been cut off. Same thing if you look at our modern word profane. Uh, that is Latin and it means profanum, that which is outside the fanum, and the fanum is the sacred space. So if you're profane or secular, you're outside, um, you're outside the sacred space. So, um, but then concretely, a sacred space in Indo European tradition should always be rectangular. That's a holy shape. It should be at least six paces by 12 paces in an east-west axis. Um, when you mark it out and when you consecrate it, you set out the cornerstones or whatever you mark it out with and you then carry your fire around the space. And in every corner, you call upon the spirits of the place and protective deities, also the striker. The striker was always um, present in ritual, in public ritual, in the form of uh, the hero. In fact, hero, uh, hero and Nero, the the, the Caesar uh, Nero, they, they are cognate. So, so the striker is present in the shape of the hero or the warrior. Um, so he's also the protector of the space. Um, but these are some some concrete. Uh, tips that I can give. Rectangular, 6 by 12 paces, east-west axis, um, carrying the fire around the space. Um, and then, again, I, I refer, to, it's a very complex ritual. Uh, it's complex, so, so I refer to episode 10 of the Harmonia podcast, where you have a full episode about sacred space its meaning its background as and how to and how to consecrate it okay. so that that was a lot but um but yeah yeah i'll leave the links um for for your videos underneath the, the video so people can refer to them because we do get a lot of questions about that people don't know you know what to do and I mean, sometimes they're in a tiny apartment and or they're in the hotel this is one of the reasons uh this is one of the reasons why this, uh, why I why why I took this initiative because there are so many people out there who are looking for genuine and authentic ways of practicing this. They are tired of doing whatever they want, or or it's like in you know in Alice in Wonderland when the when the cat well Alice asks the cat uh, where she should should be going and he says that well that depends on where you're heading. And she says, well, I don't know, and it doesn't matter. And then he says that, well, then it doesn't matter where you go. So so, so that's the same thing here, that people are tired of not knowing of not, not knowing where they're going. So uh, I recommend, I mean, I, we can't cover it all here, but I recommend the videos and the podcasts of the Harmonia Foundation. There you will have a lot of info. Um, so, yeah. Great. Yeah, I think a lot of folks are just sick and tired of all of the the kind of new age stuff and they want to know as much as possible how it was done hmm. by our ancestors. I mean, the, the, it's not really a problem with new age, etc. Again, like I said earlier, Indo-European spirituality is additive, so we add things on. But I think we need to stand on we at least need to know the foundations and the and the cornerstones of, of, and the, the crucial elements of what it is we're actually doing and why we're doing it. A lot of people just do things. They don't know why, but there are explanations and reasons why we do all these things. So that's what I'm trying to cover in my in my works, that like, why are we sacrificing? Why are we doing that within sacred space? Why is this done at all? Um, important to know yeah 
for sure. Uh, so could you could you explain the concept of Haminya? Absolutely. Haminya, and you, you asked for the Filgia too, I think. Yes, yes, both of those, yeah. So um, Haminya literally means walking in shapes. So it's a shape shifter or shape walker. Um, I'm sure your listeners have heard the verse, cattle die, kinsmen die, and so one dies oneself. One thing now that never dies, the fame of a dead man's deeds. The, the Hovamol uh, verse. And this fame they mentioned there is very important. Um, that is, um, you see it, for example, in um, this root, Klevos, in, in Proto-Indo-European. It's the same as, for example, you hear uh, Heracles or Hercules. The ending there is the same. It means uh, fame or that which has been heard of you. So... Um, and for example, it's also cognate with Slava and Slavic and Slavs, etc. And in Celtic languages is clue. So this fame is basically your karma. All your um, actions and deeds, all your thoughts, uh, everything you've achieved or not achieved, it's recorded in your, yeah, well, maybe the scientists would say your genes, like epigenetics when they found that. But so this fame is basically your karma. It's the same concept. Uh, everything you do is recorded within you, um, your actions and deeds in life. And that, those deeds, they shape your true divine self. And that will follow you forever in all your lives. So Haminya is basically cause and effect. Uh, it will always, your deeds will always color and influence your future and your conditions in life, uh, no matter what new shape you take on. So that's why it's called walking in shapes. So when we talk about shape shifting is that no matter what shape we take on, your true self, your true colors, so to say, will always be there. Uh, this part of yourself is immortal that's one of the very few things of the indo-european person which which is um immortal and this is what creates the pro programming and, and framework for what we will experience in the future uh we create patterns for ourselves based on our actions harming is also often interpreted as luck and in modern Icelandic, for example, uh, it's when you say luck, you say hamingya, til hamingya, to luck. So, but they don't mean luck as in pure chance or coincidence, but rather that you reap what you sow. So it's again, it's cause and effect. So this part, this fame, is imperishable and immortal. So, and that's where we get into the filgia because. Uh, they are basically the same. Filgia means follower. Follower is actually a bit peculiar since the filgia actually comes or goes before you. Um, this true shape of yours, this result of your deeds and your character, uh, it actually goes before you into the next life. So again, that's why, why I said that that which has been heard of you. Um, so the filgia actually goes before you into your next life and it always follows you because it is your true your true self, your true nature, um, your true shape, your honor, your insight, your protection and luck. Everything takes the shape of your filgia. So your filgia is your true shape, the follower or the totem that attaches to the new child you're born into. So the more honorably and gloriously we live, the stronger our filia will be, and it will give you better conditions and opportunities and protections in this life. Uh, here too, this is a huge topic again, so I <laughs> I refer to another Harminger podcast episode, number six, 
because there I go through all the parts of the self within Indo-European spirituality. So Harmingya podcast episode six, there I go through the parts of the self, not the least Harmingya and Filgya. But think of Harmingya and Filgya as karma. Whatever you do will follow you everywhere and anywhere. Um, and the Filgya is the totemic shape of your deeds and yourself so this uh the filgia was it a a spirit that was connected to certain families like can you could you expect your filgia to do appear differently than other family members or is it really dependent that, that on... is also that's also something we've discussed a lot in our community because there aren't actually a lot of evidence for totemism and 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 uh, and totems, etc. in 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 European culture and spirituality. There are a few, but and there are, I would say yes and no. Again, there there isn't a lot of evidence, but the the ones we have, they they point at in that direction that that um, your filgia that people believe that depending on your characteristics and features and your mentality and personality your filgia would take on uh that shape mm -hmm. for example if you're strong maybe it would be a wolf or something like that but um so yes and also it was very common in this culture that you gave your child a name based on either the characteristics you saw or character characteristics you wanted them to have. So they actually had something to live up to. So for example, um, uh, yeah, so for example, uh, Hercules, to, to name him again, means Hera's, uh, Hera's glory or Hera's honor. So it's, a, it's an uh, homage to, to Hera, the goddess, because they wanted... I mean, he has his story or history with with Hera, definitely. So, so they wanted um, some kind of reconciliation between him and and Hera. So, so he actually had a, a different name when he was born, but he was given the name of Hercules or Heracles. So, so yes, there are some such um, phenomena that we that we do see in the evidence, but not a lot. Uh, and yes, there are also some evidence of people having. Uh, family or tribe names based on animals that were um, significant for for the mentality and personality, etc. Okay, and for people that don't know anything about their filgia, how yeah. would you suggest that they go about and dis discovering something about this uh, this spirit? I suggest that I suggest that they don't, <laughs> because the, <laughs> the the thing is the thing is that if you see your filgia, you will soon die. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that, that's a sign of that you will soon die. Very, very soon you will die. So I suggest that they don't, because this is also another phenomenon that is very uh, misunderstood. Um, that, that Well, I understand that people want to know their totem and they, they want to know their field, etc. But the thing is that this it, it's better that you do some self-inquiry, self-detection, uh, some self um reflection etc and you really meditate upon yourself who am i what am i what am i good at what am i like uh, etc and you get to know your your atman your 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 the breath within you uh, then of course if you're brave and and uh you can of course there are a lot of techniques to to find out about your filgia, definitely, because we know we do know that we have it. We have a filgia who is always, which is always following us, etc. And and, but but I think that it's better to get to know your true self via your soul rather than trying to get to know your filgia in, in the in the fir, on, on on in the first step. I mean, because uh, that would be a bit dangerous. Okay. So first of all, I mean, there's a reason why the first Delphic maxim on the Temple of Apollo is "Know thyself." Mm -hmm. If you don't know yourself, then why should you be uh, going out looking for your filgia or your other other things? Uh, so first of all, know yourself. Yeah, very good advice. 
Yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit about the spirituality that came before what we know of also true? Yeah. Do we really know it as also true? I mean, well, uh, modern. To use, <laughs> to use a modern term. <laughs> I mean, also true. Also true is an extremely new. I mean, is it since the seventies? Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I'm not saying anything bad about that, but it, it's. I mean none of our ancestors would ever call themselves also true maybe i'm a bit controversial here now but no no i we, think you're they right would, they would never call themselves uh that they are also true and uh, or or something like now i'm speaking a bit swedish here but but um you know the, the um, that's a very modern term and um so what, what what exactly do you want me to to talk about when it comes to germanic germanic spirituality well, there there are some there are some things that we can piece together, but what about going way, way back in time when it was very animistic? Yeah, uh, like I said, that these protein Europeans and the 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 early Indo European peoples they migrated and expanded, and and some of them became, yeah, in, again in lack of a better word, uh, the Proto Germanics, the the first Germanic peoples, and they. Uh, they took over big parts of continental Europe and Northern Europe, Scandinavia, etc. I mean, there were Germanics in Scandinavia 5,000 years ago. Um, so, um, it's, so it's a, it's a, it's a branch of continental, continental Germanic religion. It is the traditional culturally significant religion of the Germanic peoples, um, and again, they never had a name for their religion. There, there was um... this. This is so important. So I actually want to go on a bit about this. That there was, there was never in in Indo-European culture, there was never any isolation of religion from other aspects of of culture. Um, there's a difference between having a religion and practicing life itself and growing as a person. Um, if you would say that Abrahamism is a noun, then Indo-European spirituality is a verb. It's something you do. Um, so if, if you would ask a Germanic person, one of our ancestors, uh, they would just say, what do you mean? If you would ask them, what religion do you have or what do you call it? They, said they, they wouldn't understand that concept. They would say that I just follow the customs and traditions of my ancestors. Uh, so the word said or sidr is much better, which means custom or tradition. So firn sidu and fon said, um, or alt sidu or whatever you want to call it, the old. Because again, having a name, just like I know we're going to talk about temples and shrines too. So both having a name on your religion and having temples and shrines, that's very, very often a reaction to other religions, that there's mm -hmm. something new coming in. So, so, um, but yeah, first things first. Um, so, so the, the Germanic branch of Indo-European spirituality is very similar to the others. It is uh, deeply, profoundly animistic. It has thousands and thousands and thousands of God. I wouldn't even call them gods because they rather believed in, um, spirits of the land and, and, the first gods. I think we touched upon this last time that the first uh, gods were the ancestors of the home. So um, spirits, uh, ancestors, and and spirits of the place or spirits of the of the land, deeply animistic uh, um, spirituality, and based on the same foundations as the other in European branches with fire rituals sacrifice animal sacrifice um um etc and and uh, again it's so funny when you hear online that people you hear the so-called vikings etc when they say like uh, the 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 norse or the anglo-saxons they never prayed yeah. and they, they 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 didn't purify or or you know they prayed all the time and they asked for things Mm -hmm. And they purif they had to purify, you know, they, they weren't even allowed to look at the sacred and the holy without purifying themselves. That you could be killed if you even looked at the holy without being purified and having prayed, for example. So um, so that's uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, that's, that's nonsense. 
Uh, but but the, maybe the difference is that when we pray, we do it with reciprocity. It's a this for that mentality that we, if I give you this, I promise you will get that, so to say. Yeah, a gift for a gift. Yeah. What do you say when people ask you, what are your spiritual beliefs? You know, what what term do you use or what do you say? I I talked to the other week, I talked to a very good friend of mine, Kaiser Serith. Uh, he's an expert on proto-European spirituality. He um he this is a this is his own term, he's made it up, but he recommends, he actually recommends the word centos. Uh, or sedos, because that also means like cedar. It means tradition or custom. So, but I think I just say that I um, practice the native European spirituality. That that's what I I call myself a native European and native Indo-European spirituality. Nice. That's what I call myself. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the swastika. Yeah. Let's uh, talk about the history, the importance of it in Indo-European uh, culture without talking about the Austrian painter because it's so much older than any of that. And oh, uh, yes. a lot of, you know, it was such a sacred symbol for, for our people, but a lot of people are afraid to have it in their homes. Or You know, not only, not only for our people, because um, the swastika has always been there maybe since the beginning of the human race uh you know the the oldest swastika we've found i mean there are all, even there must have been all the swastikas but um the oldest we've found and have evidence for is 15000 years old and it was found in uh, ukraine actually uh made out of a mammoth a mammoth tusk uh, or it's rather a mammoth tusk with a swastika on um it's like a it's like it made it made out of ma mammoth tusk and is shaped as a bird with a swastika on and it's 15 15000 years old so um then so again let's 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 distinguish between the symbol swastika and the word swastika so let me begin with the word swastika first it's a sanskrit word which means um, um, well-being or conducive to well-being. So it's always been associated with the, the sun, well-being, the highest consciousness and uh, protection. And so, so again, there's a difference between the, the, the Indo-European word swastika, which came into the picture maybe uh, four or five thousand years ago, uh, maybe five, five six thousand years ago, and then the symbol itself. And the symbol itself might have been there since the beginning of mankind. Um, so it's um, uh, it has to do with the sun. Everyone knows that. But uh, highest consciousness is also um, a symbol for sun and daylight. And that's very important because when we say the word deity in our language deity is cognate with daylight and deivos, which was the word for gods. So the gods were the shining ones, or the the bright ones, or the daylight ones. And where there's absence of daylight or shining light, that's death and chaos, and that's what we're striving not to have. So putting a swastika is to show that here. Uh, order and beauty prevails and here's well-being here's protection here's consciousness and strive to know yourself and to create order and beauty then there's also a difference between uh, the swastika and the sawastika that because sometimes you see them what is it like reversed like when you have it pointing to the right uh, that means sun and daylight and life and the opposite is chaos can mean not necessarily but can mean night darkness chaos etc so i think as a indo-european person you should think of a swastika as something that follows natural order because that's what we're striving for something that 
goes to the right and goes clockwise. That is to follow natural order. So it's also a symbol of or representation for following eternal natural order. Specifically in Indo-European religions, the swastika also symbolizes lightning bolts uh, representing the thunder god, the striker. So Indra, Zeus, Jupiter, Thor, Perkunos, etc. Perun. Uh, so therefore also a, a sign of protection. So uh, for all those who are afraid of using swastikas, try to um, take it back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at least 15,000 years old, old, long, long before there was a, an Austrian painter around. Uh, so, and, and yes, I know it's, it's, it's a tricky question because we can't just start using them just like that. But I'm hoping that because they do in India and, and yeah. in big parts of Asia, all over Asia. And there's, yeah, we have to take it back, to be honest. Yeah, I ha I have it in my home, yeah, uh, and a couple of different places. And um, for me, it's always been such a symbol of beauty and light. And I think that's that it's, what it is. Yeah, it is important that we we start to take that symbol back. Really important, and yeah, obviously, I think, I think um I think a lot of people are also afraid of that it would be some kind of that it represents. Indo-European people only and only their people. I, I think that's why a lot of people are afraid too. Like, like it would be some kind. I mean, it that's what it became for some kind of Aryan race, and and that we've spoken about the word Aryan too, which is also a misconception and misunderstanding. An Aryan is as a noble person uh, who follows the natural law. So again, uh, a, a noble person who follows the law. Therefore, you can also have a swastika because you you represent eternal natural law. So it has nothing to do with either uh, an ethnicity, a language, or anything like that. It has to do. It has been there uh, since the Stone Age or early Stone Age uh, and, and before that. So uh, maybe even you know maybe we will even find swastikas in cave paintings, etc. So it's been around for tens of thousands of years. Lovely. Yeah, very nice. So I would really like to talk about the goddess Danu and her importance because you don't really hear her mentioned very much anymore, you know, and uh, I, I saw on your Discord server that there are so many places and rivers named after Danu. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. In the Vedic and the, the Persian branch, you still have the goddess Danu, but around Around here, maybe um, she got a bit, uh, like what do you say, fusioned up or merged up with other river goddesses. Um, and in Norse and Germanic branch, you actually have the goddess Sigyn. And uh, that's another, that's a protein European term, which is a not another name for the, the river goddess Danu. Uh, so, for example, if you count in that name too you have see it in rivers like saon and uh seine in in paris for or france for example so so that's actually cognate with it with a germanic goddess sigin and um so um danu is one of the most in european things we have she is the mother of primordial waters she's a goddess or the, the holy rivers personified uh, all holy waters and of fertility you know when the uh, what do you say the amniotic fluid when the the, the child is, is is born there's a there's a symbolism of the dams breaking and all the water coming out and that primordial water that holy water is also done her name danu is uh, protein European stems from den or don to flow, that means. Um, and maybe some of your listeners have noticed that that don or dan is extremely common among rivers all over Europe. We have uh, Danube, uh, Dono in German, um, don, river Don, Donetsk, Dnieper, Dniester, Disna, 
We have the city of uh, Donetsk, where there's unfortunately a war right now. We have the whole country of Denmark, which is actually Danmark in Swedish and Danish. You have the nationality Dane, which is also from Danu. Um, the the Proto-Europeans themselves used to call themselves uh, Tevte Danevius, so the people of Danu. And Tevte is actually uh, thinking of you, Tina, here. Tevte, that's the root of Dutch and, and um, Deutsch. And German, German, so to say. So, uh, so that actually just Dutch and Deutsch just means uh, people. Uh, so they were the people of Danu. So, and those who know the Celtic mythology, they know that the um, Tuata de Danan, excuse my pronunciation, the the people of they, that means the people or tribe of Danu, and that's what they called uh, the original mythical race they were children of. And we have, uh, like I said, Denmark, Danube, Dorno. We have in, in England and the British Isles, we have um, heaps of rivers called Don. Uh, I think you have one. Uh, don't you have one in... Oh, you had uh, the Irish had uh, Danu and Danan. And um, Brythonic, they had goddess Don. The Romans have had, they used to call the river Danube actually Danuvius. The Brythonic, had, yeah, they had Don. Uh, the river, the Vedic river goddess is called Danu. Um, you have rivers in uh, Russia, Belarus, Lithuania, Scotland, England, Yorkshire, I think, uh, Germany, and France. They all refer to goddess Danu. Uh, we should also remember how Homer continuously refers to his quote-unquote Greek people as Dan Danans or Danans in the Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, and the northern Greeks were called Danuni, so they too stem from, from that. Uh, so I, I could go on and on. Um, she is the, the, the giver of life, the giver of fertility to the land. Um, that's also why us Indo-European peoples uh, worship by rivers and why we give votive offerings into rivers and springs. Uh, this whole uh, water symbolism also has to do with the slaying of the dragon myth, but I, I, I just can't. Uh, we don't have time for that. It's um, But just short is that when the, slaying the dragon means that you want to the, the dragon or the serpent is blocking the waters of life and someone in this case the hero has to slay the dragon or the serpent to let life come back and this has to do with danu too that uh, for example when indra or thor goes out and slays the serpent that is to bring waters of life back and that could be a symbolism for the amniotic fluid, etc., when you give birth. But um, but yeah, bringing life back. So that's quite a bit about Danu. I, let me maybe I should brag a bit here too, since that's a very Indo-European thing to do, um, <laughs> blowing your own trumpet. That my <laughs> my my own wine that I make is actually named after Danu or Danu, the the river goddess. Beautiful. So. Yeah, so I produce wine, and that's called uh, Danu. So I'm Very proud nice. of that. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you just use it for your own household to consume, or do you? Oh yeah, I consume a lot. So so yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but, but yeah, so far, so far, only for me, my family, and friends, etc. So um, so yeah, so far. Very nice. Uh, so why don't we talk about shrines? Yeah. And uh, why we should make them? Where and how? Yeah, that's also something we've spoken a lot about in our community. Um, this is a, this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, th th this is a complex question because, again, like I said earlier, shrines and temples, etc., they are historically seen quite uh, young phenomena. They're they they're not very they're, they're quite light late phenomena. Uh, Indo-European peoples haven't had temples for perhaps 2,500 years, which might sound like a lot of time, but but it isn't historically. So, uh, so, so 
first of all, maybe we should ask ourselves, why do we need shrines and temples in modern times? And why would we uh, raise, why would we uh, um, build them? Is that of some kind of uh, shallowness or something we want to prove to ourselves? Is it for egotistical reasons? Is it because we want a mission or proselytize or, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves ourselves questions why we want to do this. I personally have always wanted to build a shrine uh, be because I want, I think maybe I said in the last podcast that only 3% of the Japanese see themselves as religious, but 80% of them go to the shrine at least once a week. And that, that's a quite in, in, interesting phenomenon that I want shrines to be, or sacred space, to be somewhere where you charge your batteries, where you contemplate, where you ask yourself questions, where where you also experience yourself and your connection to nature, etc. So that that's something I want to... I would like to build something for other people to just go there, maybe have their lunch there or something, you know, just charge their batteries and a place of dignity because dignity we've lost in our time um so a place of dignity and to find your own uh your own dignity um so but again it, it's a, it's a historically seen it's, it's quite late phenomenon and uh i also said earlier that very often shrines and temples have been the result of the or the consequence of other religions that you you have something to prove it's also a, a sign or something indicating that you've become sedentary that your lifestyle changed and you weren't any any longer on on the run so to say or on the walking all the time because the earliest indo-european peoples they didn't have any shrines and temples they had uh, temporary altars and sacred spaces that they set up wherever they arrived or came um and the vedics too several millennia later they too had used to have temporary sacred spaces so the hindu temples you see in india today they are very very um uh, well they are young historically seen um but again let's so we should ask ourselves why we want to build a shrine or a temple um I would say that the best shrine or temple is the fact that you practice your spirituality, that you do it and that maybe that you do it together. Uh, I understand perfectly well that people want a place to go to, that it creates a sense of purpose, etc. I, I feel that myself. I also feel a lot of, because I do have a like a grove I go to almost every day. And I take care of it and maintain order there, so to say. And uh, that that does create a sense of purpose and, and uh, meaning in life. Uh, but the most important is that worship and rituals take place. And um, the sacred, like I said earlier, is the place you've cut off or consecrated for that sole purpose. So that can be something very temporary. And the holy is the center, the place where you build the relation with the divine, where that connection is. And I mean, the connection is only there if you maintain it. Uh, so the best shrine is where you actually uh, practice your spirit spirituality. If, you, if, if, if you'd go to a river or a stone three times a week for meditation, prayer, worship, communion with the, the holy ones then that's where the shrine is um according to me it should also be something natural a place where there either either already is a strong energy and life force i'm sure that people feel that when they feel it or a place where you create that energy and connection uh like in the video you saw with the the two brothers uh, I personally recommend very, very simple, uh, close to temporary shrines and altars uh, for that, for the sole reason that I think that in the Western world, um, 
permanent temples and shrines will get ruined by destructive forces and that would be worse so i would recommend very simple almost like portable things um or maybe just setting up sacred space when you practice your spirituality maybe that that's not the answer that people want but that's what I recommend because it, it's better that you practice your spirituality than that you, because this very easily becomes, a, you know, like a, a gear sport or something where you, when you, you're, you're looking for aesthetics rather than what you practice. People want to build these uh, flashy altars and temples and shrines. That's not really what it, what is about. We are there because we want to create that, um, communication and, and bond with the with the gods so uh also it might get ruined so maybe i'm not answering your question here but the the holy the holy is where that energy and that bond exists so it, be that by a river at a stone on a on a, a, a like a field in your home in your garden um maybe maybe if you if you specify a bit i can go more into detail but um um let me see so 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 what is your question rather like where should i build a shrine or should i build a shrine yeah more like should, should this be a part of uh practice you know people's general yeah. practice i mean for me i i'm moving to denmark yeah and we're going to have our own land and our own like we're going to plant trees just the thought of having my own shrine you know for my descendants and, and pass it on i really like the idea yeah i perfectly understand that and 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 i do too i do too. i i i feel that urge and i and i do have a grove i go to every day so um well yeah then wh why not do it and and but make it make it very simple focus on the practice and your love for the gods and spirits rather um make it uh, as simple as possible because you know some people want to build really really flashy altars etc while our ancestors they built very simple like of stone or sod or turf and grass they built small altars where they just poured their libations and, and put their oblations so it was rather about the 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 performance or the the the, the gift rather than um but then that too developed so it became more and more advanced more and more permanent um but but so 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 focus on the action focus on honorable actions and focus on creating that bond with the divine there and then and be mindful and uh, don't make it about the stuff. Mm -hmm. Make it about the place and your connection with yourself and the divine. And then again, I perfectly understand. I know that in Japan, there are more than 100,000 shrines just in, in Japan. So I would love that too around here. But we need to ask ourselves, why should we do this? And when we do, let's make sure that is not worth ruining so um, so that's my advice it is actually not so much different than the co concept of the magic circle in mm. occultism then where you in the magic circle where you practice your ritual or your yeah your your practices basically yeah. it's the exact same thing i think we also need to, to distinguish between like an altar a shrine a sacred space and and a temple i mean in in greece and rome there were what they called temenos the area where the temples were and within that area there were also like gyms and and uh, discussion clubs and and politics and there were there was everything so i mean i would love if there was a place we could go and to to meditate to talk to feel dignity to feel purpose to have dinners have feasts that's great, but maybe that's 50 years ahead uh, or 100 years. I don't know. But so let's start with actually being visible. There can't be any more hiding. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. no more hiding that's what we need to do the best shrine that's what i mean that the best shrine the best temple right now is us being out there visible showing uh dignity in our culture and our religion uh there's it's not the right time to hide anymore so just out there and practice be a group or be on your own show that you know when I started going to this growth, it's actually in a park in the center of, of the city where I live. People used to think that I'm completely mad, completely crazy. Uh, but that's okay because all of a sudden they see that you do something purposeful, something meaningful, something beautiful. We create order and beauty. And all of a sudden there are people coming up to me asking, what are you doing? Uh, why is that? Oh, wow, this looks beautiful. Um so no more hiding, no more hiding. It's not worth it. I would like to interject that uh, dignity is not expressed through dressing up like a druid or a shaman from thousand years ago and taking a selfie <laughs> to post on Instagram. Yeah, that's not what dignity <laughs> is. No, you know, you know, it's actually debated whether th there actually isn't any proof at all, basically no proof at all that Indo-European priests wore specific except for in greece and rome you see they had specific like hats or uh garlands or stuff like that uh but other than that there isn't much proof that the priests etc had any specific clothes at all but rather maybe just nice clean whole clothes that's basically what they had the best way of being a priest is to act like one mm-hmm Exactly. Honor is so important. Honor, order, order and beauty. Yeah. And uh, an honorable life. Exactly. So yeah. so maybe maybe that's the maybe that's the best shrine, your own shrine. Maybe I don't want to sound like a Christian here, but the best shrine is that you live this, that you don't just post on Instagram, but that you live a life with honor and purpose. Because I think that's what we see right now. People don't people don't feel any purpose in life. That's also why we have the 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 lack of mental health, etc. Yeah. Instead, just do something with dignity and and honor, and you will feel completely different. And just go out and do that. Set up a permanent uh, a temporary altar, and act upon it. So, yeah. um, and the shrines and temples they will come. I promise you. Yeah. Good solid advice. Yeah. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Um I'm going to leave all of the links in the below the video and we'll definitely have you on again because you're a wealth of knowledge and uh very popular with uh, our viewers. So Lovely. Yes, I'll get uh thanks very much for joining us everyone and Thank you. Ta taco farewell Bjorn. Taco farewell. Au revoir. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.